All right, let's get started with the webcast. Welcome. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about threat hunting, and we will be presenting three data science notebooks to help you find bad actors in your network's log. Uh, today's webcast is presented by Corelight and Graphistry. Uh, I'm John Gamble, Director of Product Marketing here at Corelight. And just a quick housekeeping note before we get started. Um, for those of you that have just joined since I, I made this announcement about a minute ago, um, there are two links in your chat panel at right. That's the GoToWebinar chat panel. Um, so if you click the chat panel and expand it, you'll see two links. One is to a Graphistry blog post, which at the bottom has download links. If you're so inclined and would like to download the training data and the threat hunting notebooks to follow along, not required, but if, if you'd like to do that, um, those links are available. And there's also a link to a Slack channel um, pasted in that chat. Uh, as well, which after the webcast ends, we'll be hanging around and can help people that are tinkering with the data or threat hunting notebooks or any follow-up questions that we didn't have time to answer. So again, those links are in your GoToWebinar chat panel if you uh, would like to do that. Let's get started. The agenda today, uh, we'll be taking a quick look at the tools that we're going to be using just so we can context set everybody and make sure everybody's on the same page and understands the high-level process of what's happening. And then we're going to spend most of the time in the demos and notebooks. We'll be going through three specific scenarios, uh, showing you how to hunt through SSL traffic for suspicious behavior. Uh, a second scenario, where we'll be looking for insider threat indicators in NTLM and SMB traffic. And the final and third scenario, we'll be hunting uh, in malicious, or hunting rather, I should say, in DNS traffic, looking for malicious activity. And we'll close with a QA. and um, I would encourage you to ask questions throughout. Um, and if we have time, we'll, we'll try to pause uh, uh, in, in real time and, and clarify any questions about the data you're seeing on screen, but we, we have a lot of material to get through, so we'll probably try to save most of the Q&A for the end, but enter, you can use the um, control panel to enter your questions as well. We will see them and we will get to them as we can, and if we can't, we'll follow up afterwards with you uh, or in that Slack channel that I mentioned. Today's speakers, uh, you guys are in for a treat. We've got some real expertise on the line today. Uh, we've got Richard Chit, Chidimitri, uh, Corelight Technology Evangelist, uh, prior to Corelight, uh, Chit uh, worked in, at Edward Jones as a senior security analyst and spent, before that, over a decade serving in the U.S. Navy uh, in a number of cybersecurity roles, uh, including work in the, uh, in the TAO group, which, if you're familiar, uh, will let you know that, that Ch uh, Chit has great expertise when it comes to threat hunting and cybersecurity operations. And uh, our second uh, panelist today is Leo Myrovich, CEO and co-founder of Graphistry. Um, you know, Leo's data science expertise at graph analytics expertise, just superb. And he's gonna show you um, a number of uh, really incredible capabilities that the Graphistry platform has in terms of visualizing the data that Corelight generates. And uh, not only is he the CEO and co-founder of Graphistry, but he's done uh, a lot of award-winning research, including hardening JavaScript, uh, security policy verifiers, and helping the first reactive web language um, research around that. So without, uh, further ado, um, these are the tools we're going to be using today. So threat hunting requires data. You're searching through the data, um, forming hypotheses, but you need that data. And the data that we're using today is Zeek Logs. Zeek is an open source network security monitoring framework uh, that takes your raw traffic and turns it into rich protocol organized logs. Um, Chit will be showing you some data querying screenshots. Uh, we'll be using Splunk today, but you could certainly use any SIM uh, tool or, or data storage and analytics tool that you like to conduct raw queries. Um, but really, we'll be spending most of our time in Graphistry looking at the rich visualizations and interrogations of the data that the Graphistry platform can present. Um, following at home, uh, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of this webcast, there is a dedicated Slack channel. It's pasted in the GoToWebinar chat uh, panel if you'd like to join. Uh, while the webcast will end at noon uh, Pacific time, we'll be hanging around in the Slack channel afterwards for anybody for hands-on Q&A and any further help you might need. And the training data and the threat hunting notebooks and queries you'll see in today's presentation, also available at that URL you see on screen, also pasted in the GoToWebinar chat panel, so you can download the data uh, and the threat hunting notebooks yourself and experiment and follow along. And a recording of this broadcast will be made available. We'll be hosting it uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, it'll be available in other places as well. So if you'd like to share this with colleagues or watch it a second time um, and do the walkthrough exercise yourself, that's gonna be an option. Just to context set on Zeek, because we don't want to presume um, knowledge, intimate knowledge of the audience of the Zeek framework. Um, it, it's, there's a lot to learn, but here's the high level thing, because if you don't understand this, some of the queries you see might not make sense. Zeek is an interlinked logging framework. It's a connection oriented 
logging language. So basically it looks at network sessions connections and generates logs and stamps those connections with unique IDs. So you can pivot across the protocol. So if someone establishes a connection, a connection log gets generated. If there's then an HTTP session, an HTTP session uh, log gets generated with that unique identifier connected uh, to the session. So analysts, security analysts can pivot through that and see the full spectrum of activity on the wire. So you're gonna be seeing Chit and Leo uh, make these kind of pivots uh, in, in the raw querying and in the graph history platform. That's what's happening behind the scene. That's, that's the power of the Zeek platform is it allows you to make these fast pivots uh, across things like hashes or timestamps or that unique identifier that's associated with connections. All right, let's jump into it. Scenario one, we're gonna be looking at hunting for suspicious activity in encrypted traffic streams. Uh, we picked this use case because as you know, network traffic in, in a lot of corporate environments is increasingly encrypted, but so are the attacks. Uh, the attackers are also encrypting their traffic, whether that's encrypting their C2 communications, um, you know, encrypting the files that they're using to, to kind of install and get um, placement on devices. There's a lot of encryption in attacks as well. And so we're breaking and inspecting, is it an option? How do you how do you tackle this threat? Well, as you'll see in a couple in a couple minutes, it's it's actually there's a lot of insight you can generate without breaking and inspecting the data. But you know, this is a real issue today. Not only getting visibility into encrypted traffic, but actually addressing encrypted threats. And this uh, study that was done by A10 Network shows that 41% um, of organizations uh, reported some cyber attacks uh, that were using SSL encryption to evade detection. So you know, your inline detection solution like a firewall or a or an IDS IPS, it's it's not gonna be able to give you information on encrypted uh, traffic uh, and, and threat alerting. You're gonna to have to go somewhere else. Where's that somewhere else? Well, Zeek logs. Um, so Zeek generates a number of logs. Uh, the ones in particular we'll be using for this hunt are the SSL log, uh, the X509 log, which gives certificate details. Um, we won't be touching on the SSH log today, but that also gets generated as well. These logs are really rich. They provide a bunch of great detail things like the expiration date of the certificate, so you can see soon to expire or already expired certificates being used, which may be an indicator of risk. Um, you can actually hash um, some of the SSL connections, um, which Chit will talk about more later. Chit, did you have anything to add uh, to, to these logs? Uh, just one thing is that uh, another thing we could also use is the connection log because, because the data is encrypted, you can also see data based off of producer consumer ratios of you know, which direction traffic is flowing inside this encrypted channel. Yeah, great point. Uh, the, the master log, uh, the, uh, the net flow log on steroids is that connection log, which uh, it, it unites all connections. It can be used, of course, in this context. All right, Chit, I wanna turn it over to you and Leo. So Chit, why don't you get started? Chit, you might so put yourself when on. I'm looking Oh yeah, sorry. So when when we talk about like looking at data, when we're doing a hunt, we always have to form a hypothesis. And your hypothesis is as only as good as the data that you're being provided. So when we look at it, we're looking at uh, data on the network. So one, we'll look at whether attackers are routing traffic through SSL to evade detection. Um, and then looking at whether or not there are, you know, self-signed certificates, the do-it-yourself certificates that are, you know, generated on the fly so that they can try to encrypt that traffic. Because a lot of times when they're doing this type of data expo, they're not going to have an actual certificate authority um, out there on the web providing them uh, good certificates to use. So one thing to look for is to investigate self-signed certificates. Um, looking at the generation of like expired or soon to be expired certificates. So looking at when it was issued and then how long it's you know good for. And then also looking at certs using outdated TLS versions. Um, and then also keeping an, an eye out for you know weird uh, canonical names, you know, uh, certificate authorities or, you know, issuers, things of that nature. Uh, next slide, please. So when I'm looking at a query, I kind of wanted to look, okay, what is going on with uh, SSL? So one of the things that I wanted to look at is a lot of data sets in terms of the unique identifier, you know, who originated the, uh, the connection outbound to, you know, 443 or to anything other than 443, but then also looking at the TLS version. So if you're very familiar, TLS 1.3 is going to come out. We had SSL version 3, which is the oldest that is known on the internet using for routing. It's very little. We have 1.0, which has been proven to be uh, to be easily broken. And then we have 1.2, um, which is more uh, more current um, outside of TLS 1.3. Uh, next slide, please. 
So one of the things that I wanted to look for was just validation status, looking at also versioning as well, just to get an idea of like what's going on. So as you can see, I can kind of get a good count of what's going on in the network and looking at, you know, what's running SSL version three, is it outdated, you know, TLS 1.0, is there anything in my network that still uses that versioning? Because if it is, then I need to either start investigating for, you know, potential uh, uh, exploits or anything that's of that nature. And then also to talk to my certificate authority guys internally, the certain managers to say, hey, why haven't we upgraded to, you know, 1.2 or 1.3 yet? Next slide, please. So with this, I was kind of looking, okay, well, let's look at self-signed and TLS version 1.0. Because if I'm looking at those things that are more current, now I have an issue. Because let's say that I already did some cleanup in my network and nothing should be self-signed. The certificate authority has already been managed. And I'm starting to see self-signed you know, certs on a more older version of TLS. So when I started doing the query, I'm looking at, okay, what actually is running inside my company? And as you can see, I'm seeing, you know, something with Obama at US, and unfortunately, it's looking like it's coming from the Gaza Strip. So now that's kind of a good indicator of like, okay, this is an encrypted connection. Let's start doing further investigation. Next slide. So one of the ways to do it is using, you know, Salesforce.com's J3 uh, script. And what's nice about it is that this will help you kind of identify things that are abnormal in your network by one, fingerprinting the stuff that you know is really good and building a whitelist against, but then also doing things like finding things like this Obama certificate and then fingerprinting that to see if it's starting to communicate out, you know, down. It might be good for now, potentially, it's not doing anything harmful, but as you notice it through your network, now you can start alerting and notifying and looking at what's going on. And then I would like to pivot to Leo uh, for more information inside Graphistry. Great. Thanks, Chit. Uh, Leo, I'm going to give you screen sharing permission here. Great. Uh, thanks, John. And uh, uh, thanks, everyone, for attending today. Um, this is a pretty fun one for us. All right. Great. And so I should have just gone full screen for everybody. And so um, the, uh, what, what Chit was just sharing with Splunk um, is probably familiar to a lot of the folks on the call um, who uh, maybe you're using Splunk or ArcSight or, or uh, maybe even one of the new cloud sims. Um, but uh, you, uh, some folks may have also started to notice that, um, that while that's pretty good in a kind of an independent setting, um, that some teams are starting to adopt something called uh, data science notebooks. And so uh, before, I wanna, before I jump into that exact example, um, I wanted to introduce uh, um, what's going on here and a bit about why these things are starting to get adopted. So um, what I'm showing here is just one of the uh, one of the data science notebook environments out there. This is called Google Colab. Uh, if you have a Google account, you can get it. Um, if you launch Graphistry, you would actually get something else called Jupyter. Um, it's pro Jupyter is probably the most popular and, you, and that's always free and you can download it for yourself. And what's more, um, it's generally getting adopted by um, data scientists, developers, a, a, a lot of advanced analysts especially in environments where you're doing um, like collaborative uh, analysis or rapid prototyping, things like that. So um, what's, uh, so before we think about uh, going to like exactly what that means, um, I just want to kind of give you a feel for it. So uh, a notebook is, uh, it's kind of like a Google Doc, so you can have like a URL. Um, and, uh, and the fun thing is it actually interleaves uh, uh, code and results, and the code could be any language. Uh, generally, it's Python. So here we just um, have, for example, the beginning just sets up some credentials. Um, if you're following at home, or um, what, what you'll be able to see is you can always just write a bit of, uh, a bit of code. Um, if you have an error, it will complain. But if you write good code, uh, you can see also I was able to edit the code. And then we get the result here. And, um, and uh, the power starts happening essentially from just like an individual level of um, you can, uh, for example, uh, install SDKs. Um, actually, uh, just be clear on that. Just hit Shift Enter to run code, or there's always these run buttons. But the power starts to be that you can actually interface uh, with uh, different databases. Uh, we'll be using Splunk today. You can actually do fusion. So often you might have, let's say, security logs in Splunk and account data in SQL. Um, and uh, then you can actually start applying libraries like for uh, data analytics, such as with Graphistry, uh, maybe some machine learning, um, maybe you have some automation. Um, and uh, you can actually turn these into automations. Um, and so uh, in, in this case, um, when we focus on, on a hunting team, uh, the, the notebooks actually end up getting used in roughly two ways. One is just as a, um, as a uh, independent analyst. Um, 
uh, you might uh, build up some different techniques and kind of go off-roading and play around. But then as, as you become a hunting team and you want to start adding methodology to your organization, um, we're seeing people essentially build up arsenals of notebooks for, you know, not just for past hunts, but actually for different ways of looking at different kinds of data. So if you're looking at DNS data, if you're looking at wind logs, just starting to build up different, different kinds of plays um, and having them uh, reusable and automatable through notebooks. Um, if you're following along, uh, all you need to do is uh, put in the creds. Uh, if you don't have a graphistry key, um, go to the, uh, the Slack. Uh, we updated the blog post where you can get it. Um, and then uh, if you uh, um, have your own Splunk, uh, put, put the, the logs in there and uh, what's more for the index of being, um, uh, I think, CoreLite tutorial. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to go through all that uh, uh, here. I just want to um, jump into the actual example. Um, so um, kind of like what Chit was doing, um, so for the first hunt, we're going to look at the, look at the encrypted um, uh, um, traffic, particularly from, the, in this case, the perspective of uh, TLS. Um, and uh, it feels kind of similar to Splunk. Um, this, the, this is a little worse than Splunk, where you, 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 know, you don't get the syntax highlighting. Uh, highlighting. But when um, the basic idea is we, we, when we run the search, um, we'll just get the search result and then return, turn it into something called Python pandas, which is basically a, a, a data tables that let you kind of manipulate them pretty easily. Um, and that's about all you really need to, to kind of get going with notebooks and including with graphistry. So for the case of uh, Chit's example, um, instead of doing uh, one hunt at a time, um, what our focus with a lot of the analysis today is, is instead of essentially hunt and pecking, could we actually get a whole bunch of stuff and see it together and then kind of more quickly and effectively uh, look at the different dimensions of data? So, so in this case, what that meant, for example, is we just stuff all of the related uh, um, uh, heuristics, like expired certificates, things like that, into the search. Um, we're happy to take, let's say, 50,000 uh, results. Um, in this case, we got 5,000 results. And then um, that's what we're going to look at. And, and as uh, Chip was noting, we're, we're focusing on connection logs. So um, as soon as we have a data table, um, the, one of the big tricks uh, with graph analytics is actually any, pretty much any table, any CSV, uh, there's a useful graph living in there where essentially you, we can just start correlating different dimensions. Um, and so one of the things uh, uh, for graphistry um, uh, is, well, we'll get to it in a second about the actual visualization, but one of the, the very powerful things is that we can take any, uh, they're called data, uh, data frames, but we can take any uh, data table and then pick, for example, hey, I want to see the IPs mapped out. And I'm kind of curious, for example, uh, with the certs, like the issuers and subjects, because um, I want to see if there's any of that kind of look funny. And I just want to see them all together. And I want the tool to sort of show them all, cluster them together for me. Maybe I want a bit of control over however they're linked, or I just let the tool trust me, trust it. Maybe I override the colors, things like that. So in this case, as soon as we have that data table, um, instead of kind of like going through like, like line by line and then likely missing things, we're, we're going to um, put it together and let um, technology work with us. So um, basically, I would hit Shift Enter here. I would uh, get that visualization. Um, this could be a little of a small screen here, so um, I already popped it out in a new window. Um, and so for that, uh, for this first investigation, um, uh, we we have that exact same data table, except for now it's turned into a graph. Um, and in this case, uh, what we have for the graph um, is for our nodes. We have, like I said, um, we have like. Um, IPs, certs, things like that, and edges are whenever there's an event in common. So if I if I zoom out here, um, we we start to see that um, it all got linked together. It's a bit of a mess, so I might do something like, for example, run a clustering algorithm. And so uh, when we find, for example, you know, two IPs have a lot of events between each other, they're going to get naturally pulled together. And then if um, they have nothing to do with one another, they'll drift apart. And so we start to see a bit of structure here. And and Graphistry has all sorts of tools for for understanding that kind of thing. And so we can actually understand that we, we don't need to look at all 5,000 events. We can actually see that there's like, like uh, basically different areas of incidents. Um, this still is a lot. And so what's really important for Graphistry and, and other types of visual analytics tools is to be able to quickly work across different dimensions of the data, kind of do quick thought experiments. You don't have to go back to Splunk and rewrite code, things like that. We just take a bunch of data and play. So in, in, in this case uh, for um, uh, TLS, uh, uh, and, and the particular heuristics we're, we're using, we have like two really interesting uh, levers. The first thing is the version. And so one of the columns of our data that we got back from Splunk was the TLS version. So for example, um, we have uh, 12 here, we have 10 here, and uh, uh, TLS 3 here. 
And so for the network we're looking at is uh, we only saw a little bit of uh, um, uh, TLS3. So um, which is good. That's like that. That's the clean stuff. So there's probably a lot of benign stuff that the heuristics didn't catch. Um, but we were probably more curious about, for example, the really old, uh, really old versions. Um, the other thing we we uh, have here is actually the validation status. This is also was driving a bunch of our heuristics. Um, these bars are kind of low, so I'm actually going to amp that up a bit. Um, and so uh, we have, for example, like expired expired certs and uh, self signed certs. So um, I'm going to start playing with the data. Um, first thing I'm going to do is actually, we can always color on the fly. So I'm actually going to color based on the validation status. So if we have like, a, um, uh, we, if we have any, any activity, like a coordinated activity, it's probably using the same certs. And so that'll be sort of related. And so here, for example, in red, we have all of the expired certs and here we have all the self signed. Um, uh, and, and the other part is the, uh, again, the, we probably want to Pass it on the just the start. Let's just start off to have an organized investigation. Let's just focus on the um, the really old TLS. And so for the really old TLS, we see we got a bunch, um, and uh, kind of like a, a good like a good combination of heuristics here is old TLS and self science search. It's just like a, a pretty conservative thing. So I just clicked on them. The tool created um, those filters for me. I could always back them out. Um, and now I have a lot less stuff on screen. Uh, we actually see. There's a lot of uh, now like entities that don't have any events uh, kind of saying that they're they're interesting. So if we actually got it, um, like we actually knock out all of the ones that don't have any, um, uh, um, aren't, aren't matching this criteria. Now we've actually uh, uh, really reduced the screen here. So now we're just, we've actually gone down to just 10 entities of interest and 30 edges. And I could do things like, for example, this is a little messy. So I might run the clustering algorithm again, just to clean it up a little bit. Um, and, so, and so now we can kind of take a look into what's going on. Um, so over here, for example, um, what we see is uh, one device um, uh, uh, talking to uh, um, having uh, talking to another device. Um, we see the email address here, and this is actually as Chit just showed. This we we basically very quickly without really having to think, we're able to find the the Obama scenario. And so if you just always had your um, uh, uh, your notebook for uh, um, uh, certificates, it'd be very easy to just be able to get to this case. Um, the other incident, um, but for that same exact work, we saw there was actually another incident. Um, this case, uh, we didn't have as many edges between an entity, so it was really just uh, it happened one time. Um, I can actually go th through that a little more uh, clearly. So for the uh, the Obama case, um, when we had that Obama uh, 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 um, email, we see there's actually, for example, for this IP, we have three edges here, which means that the IP, uh, we have three events here. Um, anyway, so uh, th this is kind of the first hunt. Um, we can generalize it in a bunch of different ways, but hopefully you're already starting to see that um, we can kind of skip a lot of the, the querying and kind of the, the random order of, of just uh, unorganized Splunk manual Splunk searching and actually start getting a methodical path here and uh, actually start getting in a repeatable and shareable way. With that, um, I'm going to uh, turn it back to, uh, to you, John. Great. Thanks, Leo. I was going to add something. Um, what's nice is that when we saw that Obama certificate, one of the things that because Graphistry immediately pulled that out based off the clustering of the data, we could always just Google it. We can always say like, hey, I saw this cert. Let's do a comparison. Let's pull the X509 certificate information and then see if it's on a blacklist. And then we can kind of build, you know, valuable intelligence from that framework to see, hey, is this really, you know, um, malicious or is it benign? Yeah. Um... Great point, Chit. So let's uh, pivot into the second scenario. So we're going to be doing some hunting exercises, looking for evidence of insider threats, and looking specifically in NTLM and SMB traffic. That's Microsoft Protocol traffic. So why would we be doing this? Well, you know, insider threats, whether they're malicious insiders, i.e., employees that are going rogue or have left the company. Um, or if it's an outside third party compromising, you know, internal employee credentials, and then they become the insider threat because their credentials have been uh, compromised, it's a huge, huge problem, and it's it's the cause of many, many breaches. And so, trying to look for evidence, early evidence of this behavior in your organization, is a great way to catch this activity early before it does too much damage. And in fact, this uh, this survey here that CA Technologies did found that 
over 50% of organizations reported an insider attack in the past year. So it's it's just a highly prevalent attack that is quite common across all industries and organization sizes. And uh, Chip, maybe you could comment a little bit about the logs uh, that you'll be using for these initial queries. Yeah, so what we're looking at right now is uh, a lot of the Microsoft uh, logs that are actually parsed by, by Zeek. And what's nice is that NTLM is the new technology land manager, which is used for remote login. So, you know, authentication against domain controllers. But with that information, usually NTLM links to a bunch of different things, including, you know, file access over SMB or mapping a share or even using it against RDP as well. And then sometimes if you are authenticating using, you know, uh, DCRPC, you can also see that type of information used with NTLM. Um, next slide, please. So when we look at NTLM land manager, right? So NTLM land manager, or NT land manager logins um, are very interesting because it kind of identifies host behavior, who's logging in from what host, you know, who, what, you know, um, piece of the internet are they authenticating to? So a lot of times, and I have an anecdote. I, I worked at when I worked at NSA. Um, I was at NSA CSS Hawaii, where Snowden was. So at the same time when Snowden did this leak, um, things like this information could have been caught uh, early on to show, hey, he's logging in using other people's credentials and he's scraping information uh, internally in the internet. So we could have identified insider threat um, based off of that type of information. But if you turn on NTLM. Um, logging on a domain controller, it's going to be very heavy. So you're going to get a lot of logs, a lot of logging, and it's really hard to capture. But by using Zeek logs, you can kind of profile in a very, very small format. So I would start by identifying NCLM activities, just looking at user behavior, um, pivoting into the associated connection protocol activity via the UID so that way I can identify what the NCLM uh, activity is being used for. Then I would start either mapping it with something like Graphistry and auditing, so that way I could see, hey, now that I have a new cluster built out, this is what's going to happen. And then I would also look for strange and unauthorized devices, so anything rogue, and then also, you know, user access behavior. Next slide, please. So when I look at NTLM, I, I always want to do an examination of what's going on. So when I pull up, you know, a random NTLM log, there's always that unique identifier. And by pulling that information, I can start seeing, you know, hey, you know, this username was Sonos. I saw that he was successful in logging into something, you know, via 445. He was logging in via some hosting called Intent, and then I was looking at the domain name, which is Workgroup. So next slide, please. So I pivot off of that UID, which is really nice. So now I can see all the logs that are generated from that single connection. So based off the connection, there's one con. You know, I had a modified connection log to show some other stuff. I see the files that he accessed, you know, in conjunction with the SMB files access that he had as well as the NTLM login used for this entire connection, um, as well as what map shares he had. Next slide, please. So when I pivot off of that unique identifier, I can start looking at things like what files did he access? So he opened a file, the Sonos guy, and it looks like he went to hack PNM, you know, PNM. And now I have to think about this should probably be, you know, just a music device. Why is it accessing this type of share? Um, I can look at all this other information and then just tie it back and then get to the next UID. So next slide, please. So now I can look at what he was mapping with that NTLM. So it looks like he was mapping music. But at the same time, when he's looking at, when he's doing that, I'm looking at where he's doing an IPC touch uh, in mapping IPC dollars. So that is a hidden remote share. And that is something that I need to be concerned about because, you know, what was he using IPC? Was it actually to map this, you know, this music share, or was it used for something else for like PC, RPC, or some other things? And that's why we pivot back. Um, so things of that nature. Um, believe next slide. Nope. So I will pivot to to Leo to show kind of how this helps building out like user behavior profiles inside of Graphistry. Great. Thanks, Chit. Leo, I'm going to give you screen sharing control. Great. Oh, let's get my uh, full screen going here. Yeah, so I, I really like this example for, for a couple of reasons. Um, so um, one thing is, uh, you know, insider threat, like data exfiltration, uh, access to file shares, um, whether it's a file share, a uh, like a wiki or anything like that, um, that that's, that's pretty critical for a lot of organizations. Um, 
And uh, as soon as we uh, have a you know user bump, just jumping around everything, or we have a, a device automatically doing that, it could, it could be pretty hairy to actually understand what's happening, and especially if you have interleaved behavior, maybe multiple uh, malicious or a lot of benign and, and kind of untangling it. And and the second reason uh, why, why I really like this example, um, and, uh, you know, so just be clear that like we're we're just doing it for SMBU today, but you you can do it for other things as well. But the, the other reason I like it is uh, um, kind of those hops that, that Chit just took, they're totally reasonable. And um, what, what's interesting to me is uh, we can actually just write them out and encapsulate it in a single Splunk query um, and then shift it to less about, again, hunting and pecking to more, could you just run it on everything with that rough methodology? And then in startups, trying to think of where to go next, just have it there for you. Um, and so in this case, uh, what we did is, uh, if we look at the core of this search, uh, we're just going to look at that uh, um, NTLM behavior uh, in there, and then what, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to pull out um, the the UID, and this also actually shows I think uh, the the, uh, the power of of Zeek logs here, where once we have like all of those NTLM logins and we have those UIDs, then um, without having the person do it, we just have the query do it. Is we we pivot into all of the other uh, Zeek logs to see what other hits do we have for that UID. So it's not going to be just NTLM, but it could be everything else. Um, and so we might get connection logs. We can get who knows what, right? Um, and so in this case, we're gonna we're gonna get all those hits. Um, I, we just asked for a thousand. Uh, looks like we actually didn't get a lot, just 46. Um, in a in a real enterprise, I would expect to see a, a whole lot more of uh, activity here, um, or for at least for this style of hunt. Um, and the the what we do with it is now um, where it does become SMB specific um, is uh, we are gonna as before we're gonna take a look at the IPs. But now we're also going to start looking at actually like network share activity. So um, in this case, we might want to look at like host name, domain name, what's the files involved. And if I was going to do something like uh, Dropbox uh, logs or something like that or Wiki, I, I might throw in those those URLs in here as well, right? The usernames, all that kind of stuff. And, and you can model that all together. Um, in this case, we're, we're again we're just limiting it to SMB. Um, and so and so then when we uh, when we run it, pop it out. Um, uh, now, instead of just having like that data table and trying to figure out, you know, is this one incident? Is it 10 incidents? Is it like, you know, 20, 20 incidents, but only like two of them are actually interesting, like in the rest are benign, you know? Um, what we, we actually get um, when I kind of zoom out uh, is something uh, pretty approachable. Um, uh, if you're following at home, um, what, what, uh, what I might actually really like for a scenario like this is actually, I probably would actually want to open up the time bar um, there's often different kinds of time, uh, time data, like you know when we ingested versus when when the uh, when the actual time is. Um, and just uh, as a note on the actual data set we're working with is a, a replay of a capture of the flag, and so the time bar is actually a, a bit artificial here. So it's like one one event consecutively off the other. But normally, what I would actually be able to do is like, hey, you know, maybe I want to I want to um, start with uh, the first activity and then see what happened a bit later. Um, and see and, and kind of so on and just kind of like uh, move along the the, the incidents um, or I might want to do something like in this case for example um, uh, one thing I actually often like to do is just actually color by time to understand the progression so in this case for example what I might do um, instead of having to do work it's always great when the visualization does the work for me so in this case what I'm going to do is just color the, the events cold to hot so we can close that time bar because we don't need it anymore and let's run that clustering algorithm a little bit to make sure it's a little clean. And now what we can actually start reading this is actually, it looks like there's pretty distinctly uh, two different incidents going on. At the, the cold time period, the original one, we had something going on over here. And then a bit later, uh, we had kind of a progression of things where uh, we see a lot of this inner activity here first, and then it turned into kind of more outer activity after. Um, and we can actually kind of click drag to kind of show that, that uh, distinction. So in red, we sort of have this flower shape. And then in the middle, we have, uh, I, th I think we're going to see more of this inside of the flower. And then uh, the first incident was over here. Um, what's kind of cool is by being able to actually see across time in one visualization. But what I'm actually able to say is like, look, it really is two different incidents, this one and then that one. Um, they are a little bit related. I'm actually seeing that the domain name is this work group. Um, and so that may or may not be interesting. Um, the, and now we can actually treat them separately and try to understand them separately. So if we start with uh, uh, with this guy over here, um, what's uh, we we see you know the the devices involved. Uh, we see uh, I'm guessing this is a uh, this is actually pretty interesting. 
but I'm looking at the host name. Uh, that looks pretty weird for a host name. So this is already, this is like a rogue device. Like this is already something interesting to me. And now we actually know it's like this, this rogue device. We know it's trying to do something with the browser. Um, this is kind of interesting. I might want to kind of go further. Um, now we jump to this other one. Uh, now we, we take a look. Um, when we look at the colors, um, uh, we see there's a bit of a rainbow going on. So for what we see is it's always these two devices. We have that full rainbow of, of, of activity here. And so it's kind of nice to be actually be able to see that like the activity here was going for that full time interval between these two. And what's more, uh, only these two devices are involved. So that's why they're kind of in the middle. All the other entities are basically coming from these two. Uh, these two. And then when I look at what are the other interesting things here, I'm like, okay, well, uh, is the user is called Sonos. And so uh, this, I think the Sonos is some sort of like IoT, uh, um, like uh, speaker, uh, like boombox type of thing. And, and then when I look at the, uh, what, what's actually being, uh, what, what else is going on here? I see all these files like um, hack gif .gif and hack JPEG .string. This is actually pretty weird. Um, and so, I don't really expect my my Sonos to be jumping onto doing an NTM login onto my network shares and then accessing these these actually pretty strangely named files and then so I'd, I'd have to do a bit of thinking of like what's actually this is just pretty weird like that my my speaker shouldn't be doing anything that, that looks like this. Um, so uh, in, in summary, uh, hopefully this was kind of a fun example where um, we went all the way from uh, taking what used to be a manual hunt and a pretty legit one and uh, showed that basically we can actually do a lot of uh, using the, um, the Zeek correlation IDs. We can actually um, do a couple of nested queries to actually instead of just do one thing at a time, we could just pull them out all out together. And then um, being able to actually then when we jump into the, the visualization, being able to do a bit of quick setup to actually be able to very clearly figure out, yep, here's user one, here's user two. Um, actually, on that note, maybe it's actually this is kind of a cool trick uh, um, uh, Chip was showing me earlier. You can actually, for example, color based on the user, which is another good indicator for, for different activities. And so now what we see is indeed user one is Sonos and the rest is actually we don't know the user. But, but hopefully what you're seeing is like, you know, this is where actually a small data set. But if we actually load it in, you know, with Graphistry, you could load pump in hundreds of thousands of these and it's still fine. Um, and you could do the same exact thing. Um, so with that, I, I want to I want to turn it back to uh, uh, John for I, I believe our uh, final hunt here. Great, thanks, Leo. All right, so the final scenario, scenario three. So we're going to be looking at hunts in DNS traffic looking specifically for evidence of DNS tunneling. So I think DNS-based threats are, are interesting because they're, they're quite prevalent. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of sophistication in some of the ways that attackers are manipulating DNS traffic. There's a variety of different ways that they can uh, uh, use it and hijack it. Um, and I, I think it's, it's, it's a sleeper in terms of threat recognition in the community. Um, you know, we don't see a lot of high visibility and awareness and, and strategies internally necessarily to address this particular threat. So we definitely wanted to include it um, and, and we're closing on this threat because we think it's a really important one to be aware of. So, you know, specifically DNS tunneling, right? DNS is the backbone of the internet. There's so much DNS traffic flying in and out of, of a typ typical corporate environment. It's a great place for attackers to hide. And one way they do that is by basically, you know, including their either command and control um, information and, and, and communications or data exfiltration, they'll actually encode those in DNS traffic. So it, you know, to the untrained eye, if you were to look at this, it would look like a, a DNS request. And you would kind of think, huh, that looks a little strange, but what, whatever, there's, there's a lot of these requests going on. But the reality is a, a lot of attackers are using this vector to, to, to establish control in environments and also exfiltrate data. And so, uh, the, the critical logs for this hunt, of course, are the master connection log that Zeek generates, which is that kind of NetFlow on steroids log that every connection gets, and the DNS log, of course. And the DNS log here that Zeek generates is kind of like a DNS server record on steroids. There is a ton of data fields here in a Zeek DNS log that you're just not gonna get out of your typical DNS server. And that's if you have DNS server even logging even enabled, which in many cases for performance reasons uh, isn't even enabled. But you're, you're getting the five tuple here, you're getting, you're getting the full um, kind of uh, 
I'm sorry, excuse me, you're getting the actual response of the DNS query, which is typically missing from a DNS server uh, uh, log as an example. Um, Chit, maybe you could talk about the hunting hypothesis here. Yeah, so uh, what John talked about was straight on. Um, when we talk about DNS, it's both north, south, and east, west. So DNS is utilized in most company internets, if not all, um, for everything from naming you know, hosts to servers, and then also outbound. And that's why it's really popular to use because it's something that attackers can use to get in and out north, south, but also go across east, west, um, and be relatively undetected because a lot of visibility isn't being used uh, in the east, west domain. So when we look at it, attackers will try to hide C2, data exfil, a lot of things inside DNS. And then these DNS connections will probably exhibit non-human DNS behaviors, usually in the form of really long strings. So uh, I will go over these examples uh, in my query. So next slide, please. So one of the things that I wanted to pull out was, you know, when we look at DNS entropy levels, right, for the length of a query, the max character set is 255 characters. And so when I, when I build a, a query around it, I know that anybody who's typing google.com is just going to google.com. But when I start seeing longer DNS queries, I know either it's one, somebody clicking on the link, or you know, maybe advertisement redirect. So based off of that kind of a hypothesis, now I can start, start sorting to see, okay, if I see 1v2, these probably not as bad as seeing 18 or 13,215. So when I look at it, I can still pivot off of that unique identifier. And then I can pivot into all the DNS records to see exactly what's going on and see the query, as you can see below. So when I look at this query, I see a lot of interesting things that look like command and control as well as encoded you know, string information, you know, lots of subdomains onto a TLD. And it looks like it's going to sweetcoldware.com. Now, if I advance the slide, I can start looking, okay, well, now what are the answers? And like John said, if you're not logging, um, if you're not doing DNS debug on your DNS servers, you're not going to get the answers. And a lot of times you're not going to know who actually made the official request uh, to as well. So you only see the DNS server making the request outbound. Well, now if you look at the data, you can see more encoded strings for answers. And when I think about it, DNS, when I do an answer uh, or a request, I should see an IP address. So that way it points me to the direction of where that server is located, not in more encoded strings. So this looks like command and control. And then if I pivot back to, you know, the connection log that NetFlow on steroids to see the summary of everything, I can see how many packets it, you know, worked through, how much the data was being transmitted across the session and how long it was. You know, why did it take around two seconds for this DNS query to come back? And why was it, you know, uh, looking in this manner? Uh, next slide, please. So then I can also still take that information, like, you know, the host and pivot to information like, who was he talking to? Next slide. And then also potentially what connection state history he had to all of those other you know, things internally. So now that I'm drawing back this picture, I can see you know, he was probably doing scanning. So now that I'm looking at it, it's not just DNS exfiltration. It looks like you know, it was a compromised host uh, to scan and do reconnaissance of the internal network. Next slide, please. And then I can also go back and reverse it to see who else has talked to the DNS server, who has originated outbound. And what's interesting is I see that the DNS server is outbound uh, some connections as well to the 128. So next slide. And if I do, if I pivot back to that con log, now I can see that, well, that DNS server originated data, which was in the form of an ICMP, you know, six packets of ICMP. And that's very interesting because now I know that something really definite occurred on the network. And I would like to pivot to, uh, to Leo to show how great it looks in Graphistry. Great, thank you, Chit. Great, yeah, so we, we actually end up working with a lot of folks around um, DNS data and NetFlow data. Um, we'll, we'll see it both like for internal and external uh, scenarios, like say threat research externally. Um, and uh, so before um, we go, uh, uh, deep into that exact one. I, I think it's interesting to actually just think about DNS in general. Um, so one version of the world is we just put everything on screen and just just and just figure out what's going on. Um, but uh, uh, DNS is very, and especially in a, in a big corporate network, or if you're doing like mass internet scans, things like that, it, it, like if you're an ISP or a telco, um, uh, it, it gets pretty overwhelming. You like you don't have that many pixels on your screen, and so. Um, 
one of the the first things we do in this kind of analysis is uh, we we just take all those resu re results and then what we want to do is just kind of get summaries like you know Mac like between any two uh, 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 IPs what what's the max bytes or the sum bytes like if we want to see data you know data expel you want to know how many bytes went out that kind of thing mm -hmm. um, and so and, and something like Splunk uh, that's super easy you just use stats and then we we just basically pump that through. Um, and then and then we can start mapping it out. Um, so uh, we were able to do that for this uh, this network here. Uh, I asked to just get 50,000 of these reductions and it um, uh, looked like we got about 13,000. Um, so uh, in, in this scenario, uh, when, when we got the results here, uh, we were able to um, uh, kind of get, get a nice visualization here. So um, I want to kind of show that. Um, and, and this is also for a lot of agraphistry users. It's sort of uh, kind of the first ahas where um, if you have a network, you have like, you know, 10,000, 100,000, a million devices. Um, well, actually, let's go from scratch here. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of give you that experience of just going all the way from scratch. So just being able to like take in a lot of that network data and, and just uh, load it in and see what happens um, is, is pretty amazing. So um, what we're seeing here is, uh, is actually still for Graphistry's perspective, this is still a pretty small visualization. Um, so it's about 11,000 devices and uh, 13,000 summarized uh, network communications. And, and what I did in this one, um, if you look at the, you see the edges have different colors. I did a, I, I did a quick thing uh, ahead of time where I just said, color the, the edges based on the total amount of bytes, uh, or actually the most bytes ever sent. Um, actually, uh, what I probably should have done, um, it might be a little more interesting, is to do something like the sum bytes. I don't know if we have that. Or, Let's say, for example, we look at the sum of the response bytes. And so being able to kind of get a good summary of what's going on here is, is pretty powerful. Um, so a lot of people we work with, it's, it's just kind of the first time they could, could actually see everything. Um, uh, imagine going through a timeline or whatever. Um, so now if we get to back to uh, um, the hunt, um, basically what we're trying to figure out is if somebody is abusing uh, DNS to basically do something like command and control, to do data expel, to do tunneling. Like it's basically, is, is it kind of not just being used for domain name resolution? So all we did here is we took that same query. Um, basically, you know, we were summarizing all those communications. And the thing we want on this one um, that's a little different um, is so the, we just modified a little bit is um, we want to know when the somebody makes that domain uh, name uh, request, how long was that request in case they, for example, tried to sneak a big message out that way? Likewise, when we get the response back, how big is it? So if, if, if um, they, somebody tried to sneak back a really big response. And uh, so the intuition is essentially nobody ever really wants to type a really long domain name, so they shouldn't be that long. And the domain should resolve to an IP address, not something that's another super long string. Um, and so we're going to get the, when we get those out, we, we just get the table. Um, I think this is also a great example where if you're sitting on a, on, a, on a big enterprise network, manually doing this kind of stuff is, is, is it's tough, right? That's just like a lot of ground to cover. Um, but if you can actually just load it all in and just let's see, naturally see the patterns and kind of have stuff shown to you, you can actually go, go much faster. So what we're gonna do here is actually pretty much the same exact graph. Um, now we're actually gonna color, the, the one difference is we're gonna color the, the edges here uh, based off of um, the, uh, the, the max answer line. And so let's take a quick look at that here. Um, I think it was right here. Um, and so uh, I, I just loaded that all in. And so it's the same as before, but we did one more thing where we were putting the, the questions and answers on screen here. Um, and so here, for example, we're seeing uh, the response here uh, in, in green this is sweet water. So we see a bunch of green, actually a bunch of other sweet waters, and then in blue, um, the queries. So this is some kind of machine. It looks like a nobody would ever in their right mind type, type out this query. So this is probably fake domain requests. And what's what's fun is when I when I zoom out, I'm able to see all of it, and I actually see there's two clusters of behavior um, because uh, this stuff got automatically clustered for me. We could let it uh, settle a bit more. What I'm actually seeing here, for example, in this incident, very clearly, uh, these two devices uh, talking to each other. Um, they're sending all of those like looks like the the uh, data going in both directions. And so that's that's probably tunneling. It's like a back and forth uh, uh, activity and uh, pretty heavy. Um, take a look at what's going on in that second one. Um, uh, we actually have some pretty long edges here. Um, we we see um, pretty naturally it's just these two devices were involved, um, and and we can kind of do that same uh, same analysis here. 
Uh, what's interesting to me here is just these blue nodes. And then uh, uh, remember, blue nodes, I think, were queries. Yep, so it's just queries. And so uh, if, if I was thinking about the second incident here, um, this might be uh, either a beaconing or a, a data exfil, and I, and I might try to look at the amount of like the, the bytes out, something like that, um, for what's going on here. So if I if I look at, um, well anyway, well we'll leave it we'll leave it just leave it at that in the interest of time. Um, but like stepping back again, like I, I'm I'm hoping uh, uh, it's kind of kind of you're kind of seeing here where with the one quick query you can just have here's your DNS query or here's your DNS notebook. You can actually just map out what's going on in your network in general. If you ever wanted a 360, and then you can kind of you know go the next level if you ever want to look at it from like for this type of incident in particular, and and you can kind of very quickly instead of having a whole bunch of these like interleave results, you can actually just eyeball it pretty quick, and when when you can't, you can kind of drill in and kind of go into any individual thing and kind of do this kind of reasoning. Um, I do want to do one more quick note uh, before we wrap up here. Um, as part, an interesting thing about a, a graph history is. Um, I've been showing here a lot of the uh, notebook-based workflows. All these visualizations you're seeing here, there's no reason you, you have to do them in the notebook. You can just embed them into whatever else you're doing. And then the second thing is uh, we find that a lot of folks uh, who are using a SIM or have a custom dashboard system, um, they want it, when they're doing that embedding, they actually don't want to, they still want a lot of that power of uh, the notebook. And so uh, one of the things we've been working on is things like, for example, could I pivot out from, from Splunk, let's say, on an IP address or a malware alert? And then instead of jumping into a notebook with all that boiler, Python boilerplate, um, could you actually just jump into a tool where you have eliminate the boilerplate, you just could write the Splunk queries and have those get changed together. And then you can just generate those, um, which is basically, uh, our, we've, been, we've been working in the notebook world for two or three years now. And, and so this is, uh, as we've been kind of looking at what might be more appropriate as you go more from a hunting team to an incident response team, uh, something that might make it a bit easier. Um, so with that, um, I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm gonna turn it back to you, John. Great, thank you, Leo. Hey, Leo, I just wanted to comment on something that I thought was very interesting too. So when we look at like things like Splunk, Splunk has kind of an ingest limit and data retention for X amount of days. Um, with Graphistry, we can actually just import tons of data into it, right, and look over longer periods of time yeah so um graphistry uh it, it's sort of yes and no so graphistry uh if, if you're familiar with bi tools it's sort of like a middle tier um we uh so you're not going to want to send uh you know like a petabyte of data graphistry we'll, we'll sit on top of your data lake um but but interestingly um and, and feel free to contact us about this we're working with partners for example uh, blazing vb and part of something interesting called the nvidia um, rapids ecosystem where um, to give a sense of the numbers, if you want to kind of replace your SIM with the end-to-end -end GPU computing, something like on Amazon, um, the Ethernet, just your network connection on Amazon for one node might be one to 10 gigabytes a second. GPUs could actually crunch data at that speed. And so uh, if, if you're kind of interested in what's, what's going to be replacing uh, SIM technology over the next few years in terms of if you want instant analytics, um, that, that's uh, and, and you actually want to try it out on something like for example, your flow logs on Amazon, uh, please reach out to us and we can actually get you doing some pretty killer stuff. Thanks, Leo and Shit. Um, we'll just wrap up here. I think we'll have time for one or two questions. Um, you know, just briefly about Corelight, you know, what's our role in all of this? Well, Corelight was founded by the creators of Zeek. So if you want Zeek data in your environment, if you want to be able to do these kind of queries and pivots that Shit was showing and, and visualize the data in a graph analytics tool that, like Graphistry, you're going to need the data. And in the open source world, that can take weeks or months to tune. Uh, Corelight sensors are out of the box plug and play mode. So you can basically just set these sensors up. They'll be off and running, uh, highly performant uh, compared to open source implementations and packed full of enterprise features just to make it really easy to use and even more powerful in a lot of cases with some of the integrations and capabilities we've put in the sensors. Um, so again, you know, the the it, it might not be clear to those of you who didn't weren't familiar with Zeek before this call, but the kind of queries and pivots and visualizations that you were that we, you were shown in this presentation, they're not possible without Zeek data. Like you can't do that with appliance logs, like DNS logs. Um, they're just, you're not getting the full picture in a format designed for fast search pivot and visualization. And that's exactly where Zeek comes in. And Corelight is the enterprise solution from the creators of Zeek to make Zeek deployment and data generation really easy. So you can get it to your favorite SIM and your favorite um, analytics tool downstream. 
And uh, I, I'm just so impressed by what Graphistry can do in terms of being able to show you the macro and the micro in a very intuitive visual format to be able to draw insight out of it. Leo, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, so I, I, I think um, uh, hopefully uh, just visually uh, folks were able to kind of follow along, both whether you, you want to play with the notebooks or um, you're building your own uh, uh, custom apps or uh, you want to do your own self-serve and your team wants to start automating your investigations. Um, for, for more of that post, not not the sore perspective of what you do ahead of time, but once somebody picks it up, how do you, how do, you do that? But the, the, the other bit is uh, um, for anybody interested in this stuff, um, the Graphistry, uh, some folks from the Graphistry team will be sticking around for the next hour or so online. So uh, just uh, go to the go to the um, the blog and uh, the Graphistry blog, um, and you'll see a link to the um, the Slack, uh, the updated link to the Slack channel. And um, feel free to chat with the team, and we're, we're happy to get you going on data. Awesome, thanks. Um, if you'd like, uh, as Leo mentioned, if you'd like to follow up with us, uh, the, that's the email uh, right there. You can follow up info at Corelight, info at Graphistry for further demonstrations or sales questions if you have them. Um, we have about two minutes left. Uh, so let's go. I, I tried to answer questions in real time on the chat. We had a flurry of questions come in and I was kind of individually responding. Let me just try to pick out one or two that might be a, a benefit for the broader audience. Um, we had a question about um, encryption and, and digging into exactly what kind of data is being parsed and shown here and searched. So just to kind of reiterate what I said at the beginning, um, Zeek as a network security monitoring framework and Corelight using that technology does not break and inspect the traffic. So all the logs that you saw, the SSL log, the X509 log, and all the pivots that Chit and Leo were doing, um, those are occurring uh, around data that was extracted from the certificates of those encrypted traffic streams and the nature of the encrypted uh, protocol handshakes being parsed as well. So there's no break and inspect happening. But as you saw, um, they were able to pull out and find, uh, you know, potentially malicious activity without breaking and inspecting the traffic. So that's that's the power of, of this data format and these search tools that you were shown. Um, and then the last question uh, I'll, I'll leave for you, Leo. Um, we had a question here about Graphistry. Uh, are most of your users using notebooks? And can you explain uh, how people are generally using Graphistry? What are the main use cases? Yeah, so um, we're seeing uh, use all over, like cyber, fraud, uh, um, counter-terror, that, that all, all sorts of stuff like uh, on, on digital crime, essentially. Um, what we find is it's really, uh, um, there aren't, uh, we'll see uh, uh, data scientists and, um, uh, and hunting teams will be doing the, the notebook stuff. But very quickly, uh, um, if, if you're uh, more of like an incident response team, um, we are actually seeing people more interested and, and more successful with just setting up the, basically setting up plays uh, using the, those templates, um, the, the thing I was just showing at the end. And, and basically, essentially the, the intuition is you need to respond fast and you need to be able to, let's say, run 15 steps of, of data gathering and be able to pivot around. And so you don't really have that time to write Python or, or, or SQL but you do have the time to set it up ahead of time so that when that incident does come in, you've got all of those plays set up ahead of time. Um, so Great. it's really more, more by the team. Great. Well, with that, we're at the hour. Um, I hope I answered most people's inline questions in the chat box. Um, just, just as a point of note, a couple people asked about recordings and availability. This is being recorded. It will be publicly available later. Um, I know it was a lot of information to take in. So some of you asked for rewatch and yes, you will. Shortly, we'll email you and give you the ability to, to follow along and rewatch this program if you'd like to trial some of the queries you saw yourself and visualizations. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, the Slack channel uh, that is in the chat uh, uh, link in the sidebar is now uh, live. So Graphistry folks and some Correlate folks will be hanging around if you have particular questions. Um, and if we didn't get to answer your question, I apologize. Uh, I'll follow up with you individually. I, I see a couple more that we weren't able to answer and I'll, I'll just ping you individually. So thank you everyone for attending today. I hope you learned a lot. I certainly did. Um, and Chit and Leo, thank you so much for bringing your expertise to bear. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, John. Thanks uh, for helping organize this. All right, that's a wrap. Take care. Thanks, Bill. Bye.